Um, I'd like to thank uh, everyone for who is joining us today. Welcome to today's CNCF webinar, uh, Data Services for Cloud Native Workloads. Uh, my name is Ariel Jatib. I'm a Business Development Manager at NetApp and a CNCF Ambassador. I'll be moderating today's webinar. Uh, we'd like to welcome our presenters today, uh, Abe Singh, Founding Engineer and Architect at Diamante, uh, Shilpa Mayana, member of the technical staff, and Naren Narendra, Director of Product Marketing. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items. Uh, during the webinar, you're not gonna be able to talk as an attendee. There is a Q&A box uh, that you're gonna see at the bottom of your screen. Uh, please feel free to drop your question in there and we'll get to as many as we can uh, at the end. Uh, this is uh, an official webinar of the CNCF, and as such, is subject to the CNCF Code of Conduct. Uh, please do not say anything or, uh, to the chat or the questions that would be in violation of that Code of Conduct. Basically, uh, please be respectful of all your fellow participants and presenters. Um, also, please note that a recording and slides will be posted today, uh, later, uh, on the CNCF webinar page at cncf.io forward slash webinars. Uh, and with that, I'll hand over, uh, I'll hand it over to the team from Diamante and uh, kick off today's presentation. All right. Thank you, Ariel. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining us uh, in these busy times. I hope everyone is staying safe. Let's get uh, started. Uh, just a quick intro. Uh, I'm Abhay, Abhay Singh, a founding engineer and architect at Diamante. Uh, we have Narain from uh, product marketing and Shilpa also from uh, technical team, engineering team. I'll quickly go over the agenda. So uh, in today's webinar, uh, I'm going to start with some cloud native fundamentals before getting into data services and recovery point or recovery time objectives these services provide. Data services uh, that I'm going to talk about today are the services that protect data against any kind of failure. It could be a software failure, hardware failure, node failure, network failure, data center, and so on, data center failure, and so on. And we'll also see why it's critical for storage architecture to adhere to cloud native principles for these data services. We'll, uh, uh, after that, we'll go uh, with few demos that uh, Shilpa is gonna help me with and followed by uh, Q&A. Okay. These are the cloud native storage fundamentals that I'm uh, gonna briefly talk about. Scaling, resiliency, isolation, tiering, and mobility, and how they are, uh, how a storage architecture should take care of uh, uh, these uh, fundamentals at architecture, architecture level. So uh, one of the, uh, the fundamentals are uh, scaling, right? So because the need application may require uh, the need for uh, resources as well as uh, um, IOPS and bandwidth can go up and down depending on the need of application. So underlying storage infrastructure should be able to provide that support. So when we uh, talk about scaling, uh, a, a lot of times people talk about uh, creating multiple uh, replicas, replicas, and it should basically scale, scale out rather. Uh, in other words, scale out. However, that doesn't complete the whole story. The uh, specifically for a stateful application, story completes uh, if um, underlying uh, storage infrastructure can also scale up the IOPS or bandwidth needed for the application whenever, whenever, it, is, whenever it is needed. So uh, when we talk about scaling, it's both in terms of capacity as well as uh, performance. Provisioned IOPS, we should be able to uh, scale up and down uh, depending on the need. The next is uh, resiliency. Microservices uh, can fail and restart. So uh, the restart could be on a different node, could be in a different uh, zone, different data centers. So 
there has to be some data service at the back that provides data access whenever, uh, whenever and wherever application or microservice comes up. Anything uh, that can fail will fail at some point of time. So uh, our infrastructure should be able to, uh, to have those uh, things built in to provide the required resiliency. It's uh, not only microservice, but any of the components uh, can fail. A node can fail, drive can fail. So that in order to have the data available, we need uh, these data services at services to uh, support resiliency of uh, resiliency for microservices. The next is isolation. So the whole premise of uh, cloud native uh, uh, is we share the common infrastructure and a variety of applications can run on the same infrastructure, which means applications with a different kind of IO loads, different uh, requirements will be running on the same infrastructure. They would be uh, uh, sharing the same node, same CPU, same PCI lanes, all the way to same, maybe same set of drives. So noisy neighbor uh, problem uh, is, uh, is really complex uh, to address and it's very important to address uh, for uh, such environments. It may, uh, for security, we, we may require per volume encryption because there can be multiple tenants running on the same infrastructure. So you may need to secure uh, each and every tenant or each for, for that matter, each and every volume uh, independently with, it, with their own keys. Let's move to the next. Tiering. Some applications may uh, require a high access, high level of access. Uh, another application may require medium or low. There are multiple ways to look at this problem. One, uh, a lot of people uh, solve this problem by media type. So anything that is uh, a high priority or requires uh, a low latency access would be located from, at least from the storage perspective, would be located on flash. Secondary uh, data could be located on, um, uh, on uh, hard drives or could be located uh, uh, far. What we believe is in standardizing the infrastructure and virtualizing the tiers. So the same infrastructure is used for all kinds of applications. And what, uh, what can be done is uh, tiers can be virtualized. So high tier uh, application can get, uh, let's say 40K, 50K, 100K IOPS. There can be a mid tier which may get say 10 to 20K IOPS, low tier can get one, uh, 1K to 2K IOPS. But everything is running on the same uh, infrastructure. Uh, the underlying the storage layer takes care of the tiering. So we believe that NVMe is uh, the new SETA. Uh, earlier, uh, the quality of drives uh, were defined by, let's say RPM, 15K RPM, 10K, 5K. And now that has uh, kind of uh, transitions to number of drive writes per day. So for example, 10 drive writes per day, five, one, and so on. So it can be virtualized up to that layer two, up to that level two. So for one application, a volume can be provided that supports 10 writes a day, for example. For another application, uh, it, a virtualized volume uh, can provide one write right a day. And storage classes have been designed to do same. So these things can be configured using a storage classes uh, in Kubernetes environments. So the last one uh, that I'm going to touch on is mobility. So uh, application mobility requires efficient data mobility as well. In case of uh, multi-zone clusters, the data or data could be sitting in two zones. Uh, could be in two uh, uh, different rooms in the same data center or completely two different data centers. 
in case of failure or whenever a node, uh, whenever an application needs to move to another data center, the, the data has to be available there. So it requires efficient migration and replication uh, uh, solutions or services at storage layer. So another way to look at it is uh, uh, for some of the secondary applications like um, test and dev or analytics, you, uh, a user may want require to move the data to a different cluster and uh, run, their, uh, the, run their workload. However, if uh, underlying infrastructure itself provides isolation and tiering that I just talked about, then maybe those secondary applications can run directly on the same infrastructure without affecting uh, primary applications and their performance. Right. So in, in that case, uh, uh, there may not be, it, it may not be needed to copy the data to another place for these applications or these workloads. All right, uh, moving forward. So these are the data services that uh, I'm gonna talk about today, mirroring, snapshot, backup, replication. They all have their specific uh, use cases. And it's not that I'm not uh, gonna uh, advertise that you need mirroring and it solves all your problems. And the same for other uh, services too. We need we need all, and they all serve uh, different purposes. Let's uh, take a look at what kind of RPO RTO these uh, services provide, and and what actually it means. So all these services have a, a different schedule. Traditional tape backup uh, where you move tape off, off premises, uh, the schedule is runs in days or weeks. Backup are typically done, uh, let's say once a day or so. Snapshots could have a lower uh, schedule, for example, if num few snapshots every day, every four hours or every six hours. Replication is uh, in general. When I say replication, uh, I mean as asynchronous replication. For synchronous replication, I'm using the term mirroring here. So uh, replication uh, runs behind typically a uh, few minutes, could be 10, 15, 20 minutes. And mirroring is uh, synchronous. So application rights are not acknowledged to the host until it gets written uh, at all the places. So in case of two-way mirror, it needs to be written at both the places. Three-way mirror would require these, the data to be written at all three places before application IOs are acknowledged. It has uh, latency implications. So we do not recommend mirrors to be separated by long distances. The schedule of uh, these data services defines what kind of recovery point you can achieve. So if you need to recover data from the tape backup, the data that you're gonna get is gonna be days behind, depending on when was uh, the last uh, scheduled tape backup. And the same is for backup, snapshot, and replication. So going to if when you go to the last backup, that, that basically kind of defines what is the RPO uh, going to be provided by these services. So how far back you need to go uh, to recover your data. RTO defines how long does it take uh, to recover your data from these uh, data services. In case of uh, traditional tape backup, it typically uh, day, take days before you can get your data <clears throat> and have your application up and running. 
disk backup, cloud backup also takes hours before you can populate your data and application can be brought up. Snapshot. Snapshot is interesting because uh, it uh, totally depends on, uh, on the architecture, how much RTO you can achieve. Schedule is in general configurable every four hours, six hours, so that defines the RPU. But how long it takes to recover, it uh, totally depends on the snapshot architecture. If it in involves data copy, then again, it can take uh, hours before you can uh, bring up your application and recover the data. However, uh, an archi architecture can provide instant restore, then you, within minutes, you can be up and running. The same goes uh, with replication because data is getting replicated to a different site and data is available. It can, it will probably be a few minutes behind, but it can be brought up. Application can be brought up within minutes once the failure is detected. Finally, mirroring. Mirroring uh, would provide near zero RPO and RTO. Near zero RPO because uh, the data is syn synchronously getting written to both the places. And once the failure is detected on uh, one site or uh, one zone, it can be brought up uh, immediately on, on the second zone where data is available. So for most of these uh, data uh, data services that I talked about, except mirroring, snapshot snapshot technology basically forms the the base or core of uh, of the data service. Backups are typically done on top of snapshot in order to be consistent. Replication uh, can also be done uh, on top of snapshots. Uh, there are uh, continuous replication uh, solutions too, but if uh, RPO uh, requirement is uh, beyond uh, 10 minutes or 15 minutes for, for replication, then it's uh, typically snapshot-based periodic replication is more efficient. So snapshot architecture matters for, uh, for all these data services. And whether we adhere to uh, the cloud native principles is also important. For example, is snapshot uh, space optimized? That basically defines how much you can scale. Does it require data copy? If it requires data copy, uh, then you are in, 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 you may be affecting your primary uh, application as well. And it also uh, limits the, the scaling. How fast uh, can data be restored? Can it provide instant restore? So that basically defines the resiliency of the system. If it takes hours before you can, uh, uh, you can recover your application, that's not resilient enough. Can snapshot access be a different tier? So application is running in a high tier, uh, a virtualized high tier, can uh, another secondary workload whether it's uh, taking the backup or running some kind of test and dev or, uh, or analytics application, which can run on snapshot, can it be provided on a different tier, medium or low, so that it doesn't affect uh, the primary applications running on the same infrastructure? Which means basically, is your uh, storage infrastructure is providing enough isolation or tiering? Does addition of snapshots uh, affect parent volumes performance? Which, uh, uh, which uh, basically clearly defined by isolation. Then both the workloads are actually not isolated from each other. So uh, with that, uh, I would hand over to uh, Shilpa for 
for the demos. Let me stop sharing. Uh, thanks, Abhay. Uh, hi, everyone. This is uh, Shilpa Mayana. Uh, today, I'll be demonstrating some of the uh, key data service features that are available on Diamante platform. Uh, first, let me share my screen. Okay, first I'll go over the mirroring feature support that we have on Diamante platform. So with this, you're going to see how a stateful applications can seamlessly fail over from one node to another node within the Diamante cluster whenever there is a node failure. So you're going to see how applications can seamlessly fail over without experiencing any data loss because the data is highly available on Diamante platform. For this demo, we have a topology set up this way. There is a cluster that's already created with multiple nodes. There's an application that is running on one of the nodes in the cluster. And this application is using a persistent storage uh, on a Diamante volume. The volume itself is actually created on two different nodes in the cluster. It has two mirrors. So whenever the application is performing writes to the volume, the storage subsystem ensures that the data is synchronously replicated across both the available mirrors in the cluster. So uh, with this, in case uh, if there is any node loss in the cluster, if a cluster happens to lose a node on which the application is running, the application can seamlessly fail over to another node where the mirror exists you're gonna see that the application won't experience any data loss and it can start resuming from where it left off. So now I'm gonna sh start sharing the demo screen here. As I mentioned earlier, there is already a cluster created this cluster has three nodes here. Uh, and I've also deployed an application. Uh, it's a WordPress application that is using MySQL database in that backend for its persistent storage. Uh, these volumes are associated with the given PVCs here. And um, let's take a look at the volume that corresponds to MySQL uh, PVC. Uh, you can see here there are two mirrors for this volume that are created on two different nodes in the cluster. Application itself is running on AppServe 86 and both the mirrors that are available for this volume is kept in sync, which means when application is performing writes on this volume, the storage subsystem is making sure that the data is kept in sync on both the available copies. Now let's verify what we have within this application. Currently I have uh, the applica WordPress application running on this particular IP address. So through the browser, I'm gonna just verify what the application has. There is a simple Diamante website created here, which is pre-populated with some blogs. As you can see, there are two blogs created. I'm gonna create one more block here saying that I'm going to test application failover. Publish the blog. Let's verify this blog on the website. As you can see, the new blog that I posted appears on the website. The data for this is persistently stored on MySQL database. So now I'm gonna simulate a node failure. So in order to bring down the node, I'm just gonna cordon uh, the node on which the application is running and then delete the pods manually. 
Up sub 86 is cordant and both the pods that are running on this node has been deleted. Since these pods were created with Kubernetes deployment, uh, the moment the pods are deleted, the deployment controller will automatically create another instance of these pods. And this will cause the application to fail over on any of the available nodes in the cluster. Now let's verify the status of the new pods that are created. As you can see here, the new pod, both of these pods got failed over to AppSub87, which is where the other mirror existed on the system. And there is the same IP address associated with that pod. Let's verify the content of this application one more time. And look at all the blocks. As you can see here, uh, although the application failed over, it didn't have any impact uh, because it has up to date data. There is um, uh, no time spent in the recovery of the data. So this is how the applications can get an RTO and RPO of zero when there is a mirroring feature enabled on the system. So now let's verify the status of the volume that corresponds to the application. As you can see here, uh, one of the mirror for this volume is in detached state. And the reason for that is AppServ86 was previously cordoned. Now, uh, the moment I uncordon this node, uh, the backend system will start the synchronization of this mirror and it will bring this, uh, both the mirrors back in sync. Let's take a look at the volume status one more time. And you can see now both the mirrors are active and both are in sync. So uh, this completes the demo that I had for uh, synchronous mirroring feature. Let's move on to the next demo. So here um, I'm going to demonstrate how you can instantly restore a volume from a given snapshot. A uh, snapshot is a way of providing data protection uh, for volumes within the cluster. So when you create a snapshot, it actually captures a state of a volume at a specific point in time. So this is how the uh, topology looks like for the demo. There's an application running, which is using a Diamante volume for its persistent storage. You can actually set up a volume to take periodic snapshots in the cluster at regular intervals. And uh, during this time, if application accidentally overrides any data within the volume, you can still choose to restore this volume for any, from any of the available snapshots in the system. So we do have support for something called instant snapshots restore. Here, there is no time consuming data copy. It just happens within few seconds. The moment you specify a snapshot for a volume, it, all the data from the snapshot data will be available on the volume. So now let's move on to the demo here. And uh, I'll be walking through the steps on how to create a snapshot of a volume and how do we restore that volume from a snapshot. Again, for this demo, I am going to use the same cluster. And um, I'm going to take a snapshot of a volume that corresponds to one of this application here. In order to create the snapshot, I'm going to log on to uh, Diamante UI. Uh, this is the cluster that I'm trying to operate on. So when you look at the list of volumes that it has, it reflects both the volumes that is associated with the app. Here, I want to create a snapshot of a volume that corresponds to MySQL PVC. So there's an option to create snapshot from the UI here. And I can choose on which node I want to create the snapshot on.
So now you can see there is one snapshot created for this volume. Let's take a look at the snapshot page here. There's a snapshot that's in available state. At this point in time, this snapshot has all the information that was there uh, within the volume for this application. So now I'm going to do some writes on, uh, modify this application to delete some of the blogs. Let me also delete this blog. Let's go back to the website and you can see right now there is only one blog that exists which is called Diamante Vision. So now I want to now uh, restore my applications data from the snapshot to recover all the blog that has been deleted. So how do I do that? I can choose to restore the original volume itself from the snapshot, but in order to do this, I'll have to first bring down the application. So since it is created as a Kubernetes deployment, I'm going to scale down both of these applications to have the replica count zero. So at this point, the volumes is actually detached. And it's an available status. Now you can choose to restore this volume from a given snapshot in the system. So this is the snapshot that was created prior to modifying the application. I'm going to check this box to say I want to proceed restore. So the moment I restore the snapshot, you can see the volume immediately goes into available state. So now this volume can be used to bring up the application. So all I have to do is again scale up the application here. I'm going to reset the replica count back to one. Let's look at the status of this volume on the UI. Both of the volumes should transition to attach state. And re-verify the application. To see if it has all the blogs that were previously deleted. So as you saw, like prior to uh, Creating the snapshot, I had all of these blog information. Later, I modified my app to delete these blogs. Now, once I restored this application, all the blogs are back within the volume. This shows that the volume that we had was instantly restored from the snapshot within the cluster. So with this, um, I'm going to move on to the next demo. So here um, I'll be demonstrating how to set up a replication of a set of volumes across Diamante cluster. With the last demo, you saw that uh, there we enable data protection for volumes within the cluster. Uh, here we're going to extend this across clusters. So this is basically done to handle disaster recovery. So in case of losing the entire primary cluster, the application can still be brought up on the DR site with the replicated data. However, uh, when the application is brought up on the DR site, uh, the volume that it's gonna use is based on when the data was last replicated from the primary cluster. So for this demo, I have two clusters created here. One is the primary cluster, which is also called active cluster. And the other one on the right side is my DR cluster. There is an application that's running on the primary cluster, uh, which is using Diamante volume. So 
whenever you set up a replication across clusters, there is a driver that runs within the cluster to facilitate this operation. On the primary cluster, there is a snapshot of a volume that's taken. And this snapshotted volume is used by the replication driver to copy the data onto the DR cluster. On the DR cluster, now again, a snapshot of a volume is taken. And this is basically done to keep the snapshots consistent across both the primary and the DR cluster. So for this, again, let's go back to the demo screen. So, um, I'm going to use the same cluster here for uh, the primary site, the one that I had for uh, mirroring and snapshot. And there is a DR cluster that's created on the secondary site. And uh, let's verify what we have on the DR cluster. Currently, there are no applications running, and there are no PVs or PVCs. On the primary site, I have WordPress application and MySQL database running. And both of these are associated with two PVCs here. Now I'm going to set up a replication for both of these PVCs to copy the data from primary cluster to the DR cluster. So for this, let me go back to the UI here. First, I need to set up the volumes on the DR cluster. Currently, there, is, there are no volumes on the DR site. I'm going to create a PVC here. And this PVC is created with the exact same name as it appears on the primary cluster. Let's wait for the PVC to be created. Now I'm going to create the second PVC. Okay, so now both the PVCs are created on the DR cluster. Now we can actually go ahead and set up a replication for these two volumes on the DR site. So for this, we're going to create a replication object. So this is, since this is the target, I'm going to name the replication object as target and also set up the role for this as a target endpoint. And um, here there, is, there are multiple volumes that is replicated within a given replication object. So I'm going to create a PVC group for it and add both the PVCs within this group. So now we have everything set up on the DR cluster for the replication. Let's go back to the primary site. On the primary side, the volume already exists. We just have to go and create a replication object for this volume. I'm going to name the replication object as source. Set up the role as source here. I'm going to specify the remote endpoint where the replicated data needs to, cop needs to be copied onto. So this is the IP address associated with the replication driver that comes up on the DR site. So here you can specify the interval, how often you want the data to be replicated between these clusters. Again, here we are going to group the volumes that we have here into a PVC group. And save the replication object. So at this point in time, 
we have replication objects created both on the source cluster as well as the DR cluster. Let's see what objects got created on both of these cluster as a result of setting up the replication. The first step I created two PVCs to match the PVC that exists on the source cluster, which is MySQL PVC and WP PVC. There's also a PV that corresponds to these PVCs here. And there is a DMRT volume that got created as a result of this PVC creation. These are the volume that corresponds to both of these PVCs. And the replication object is created as a Kubernetes custom resource. The describe on this replication object will have all the parameters that were specified through the UI. And this includes the information about the PVC map and the frequency for the replication and the role for this cluster. Similarly, on the primary side, we have the exact same replication object created. And let's take a deep look at this replication object on the source side. Here, so we have a list of PVCs provided to this replication object. There's a destination endpoint that is specified uh, to uh, copy the data onto. And there's an RPO interval here, which says this replication has to be done every fifth minute in an hour. Currently, the replication is not running. It's in the detached state. Whenever the replication starts, you can see the admin state of this object going into attached state. And the connection will also reflect accordingly. And once the replication completes, the status of this object gets updated to indicate uh, when did the replication start, how long it took, and also the number of blocks that got transferred. As a result of creating this replication object, the replication driver creates a Kubernetes cron job, and this cron job will be set up to run um, on every fifth minute which is the replication interval that we specified. Currently, the replication is active. It started like few seconds back. Let's verify the status of this cron job one more time. Replication is also completed. At this point in time, you can actually do a describe on the replications and see the status of this object. Here it says the number of blocks that was transferred during this replication is 4,000, 409,000. And uh, these, uh, the status of this replication says it is completed successfully. Now we know the volume that on the DR cluster has been populated with the data from the primary cluster. How do we verify what exists on the volume on the DR side? For this, I'm going to run a fire drill operation. And uh, for in order to run this fire drill operation, first I need to go and create a volume from the snapshot on the DR site. There are two snapshots that got created on the DR cluster after the replication process. So here I'm gonna say, I wanna create a volume from the snapshot for this fire drill application. And this fire drill application expects the volume to be with certain name. So I have to create the name, uh, the volume with the exact same name. And similarly for this as well. So both of these snapshots now has volumes created. So with this, let's go back to the DR cluster 
and try to spin up the application here. So this application is exactly same as it appears on the source side. Let's verify the status of this application. WordPress is running and this is the IP address that is associated with the WordPress on the DR cluster. Now let's verify what this application has on the DR side. As you can see here, the DR cluster's volume has exactly same blogs that were posted from the primary site. So this shows that our fire drill operation completed successfully. The data that we have on the DR site reflects the exact same data that we had on the primary site. Uh, this pretty much concludes what I had for the demo today. I'm now going to hand it over to Naring. I'll stop sharing. All right. Thank you, Shilpa. Can you folks see my screen? Can you hear me well? Yes. Thank you so much. All right. Um, so you, Abai talked about the fundamentals of data services for cloud native workloads, uh, as well as some of the attributes regarding the types of data services that we could have, as well as what do we get out of each of those types of services, as well as the key demos of those uh, requirements and features. But overall, you know, CSI, container storage interface, is the conduit or the gateway for any data services in Kubernetes. So just to sort of um, cover CSI at a very high level, container storage interface is actually based on uh, flex volume. And flex volume is something that DMRT actually uh, worked on along with the rest of the community members, such as Google, uh, to uh, make it open source and contributed into the community back in the days, which finally evolved into container storage interface, which we use today for all storage services uh, in Kubernetes. And this was the beginning uh, where, or, or this was the point of time when we could start running stateful applications uh, on Kubernetes. Um, and it was a very uh, critical point to uh, you know, make Kubernetes the infrastructure for any application, whether it's stateful or stateless. At the same time, another important aspect here uh, is, you know, we can have different types of data services. We can have different types of uh, um, requirements for each of our applications, but at the same time, uh, doing a bottom up view uh, of infrastructure up to the application, one of the key things is also uh, scheduler extensions. So if we have an application, we should be able to deploy those cloud native workloads using specific well-defined attributes that match the best infrastructure and resource choices. This enables us to use, uh, utilize the best uh, choice of infrastructure as well as efficiently utilize all of the options available to us. And that is driven through scheduler extensions which again, uh, Diamante uh, was a key contributor to uh, in the early days. Um, so we, we heard about data services overall. So any storage system, any data system that we have, uh, the key uh, pieces that it needs to uh, offer are mirroring, snapshot, backup, and uh, replication. And we have heard about this. At the same time, you know, okay, so those are the key services that we need to have, but what are some of the uh, key requirements for data services uh, infrastructure in a cloud native uh, environment, right? So uh, just to recap from uh, what Abhay and Shilpa covered here, uh, scalability is very important. Scalability with respect to uh, being able to increase or decrease, decrease in capacity, as well as 
uh, according to the demands of the applications being able to cater to their performance requirements. Uh, resiliency is uh, very critical and resiliency on a per volume basis, not only, not only as a full fledged system, but being able to granularly uh, provide that at a volume level. Uh, isolation, yes, uh, you know, we can have the ultra fast storage system, but at the same time, uh, it needs to be able to isolate noisy neighbors so that we don't end up uh, over provisioning the infrastructure uh, because one application at some point uh, in a very uncontrollable fashion is gonna take over the entire system because there are no bounds, there are no limitations of the amount of resources that it can use at any point in the system. And then, of course, isolation is not only for performance, uh, performance attributes, it's also for uh, security reasons so that one application is completely separated from another one, uh, con control plane is separated from tenants, uh, and give us those fundamental um, bounds within which applications can operate. Uh, tiering. So end of the day, you know, we will have one infrastructure, so we should be able to uh, deploy many applications with different types of requirements and an infrastructure uh, and the data services within that infrastructure needs to be able to provide this, right? Uh, and not only that, it also needs to be able to uh, provide some sort of a policy-based mechanism so that, you know, scalability, resiliency, isolation, all of these could be achieved, enforced, and implemented in a very seamless and consistent manner. Last but not the least, uh, in terms of the overall um, uh, you know, data attributes is mobility, right? So, and again, mobility is not just data, it's application and data mobility on demand or by choice. Um, and being able to migrate applications, migrate data, as well as to replicate data in a very efficient, as well as timely manner. And of course, all of these things land into the, uh, the key requirements that an application will have or an organization will have with respect to the RPO, RTO targets, recovery point objective and recovery time objective targets. Uh, another, uh, th another key point in this checklist is form factor. You know, are we looking for a data, you know, storage or data services system that is dedicated only to storage? Are we looking at a hybrid convert system here as well as, or is it a cloud or hybrid cloud um, architecture or uh, design that you would like to take on. Of course, cost is very important. So what is the cost per unit of storage with respect to replication, with respect to scalability, with respect to overall storage, um, all that matters. And also, while we, uh, you know, we are seeing exodus of data, exodus of information being out there, uh, it also comes down to resource efficiencies. Are there ways that we can leverage advancements in silicon to actually be able to have a very optimal cost per unit of storage and hardware resource utilization to achieve all of these uh, uh, requirements? All right. So those with that, uh, you know, here is more information if you'd like to learn uh, about uh, us. Um, you can go to diamante.com to see what's coming up from DMRT next. Um, you know, as we talked about data services and stateful applications in a timely manner on May 21st, we have, a, we are hosting a webinar on supercharging your stateful applications like any, you know, your database applications, for example, Postgres, MariaDB, MongoDB, Microsoft SQL. So be sure to join us on May 21st. Of course, uh, diamante.com has a lot of uh, very useful resources. Go to diamante.com slash resources. There's a bunch of white papers as well as key customer case studies. Uh, one of the key ones here noted is Intesa San Paolo, uh, who, who fast tracked their digital transformation with Diamante. Uh, of course, at any time, you can follow us on LinkedIn, Twitter, and uh, Facebook. All right, with that, let's uh, transition to uh, Q&A.
Hey, uh, this is Aaron. I think they, there was a couple answers and folks uh, responded, but uh, we'll capture it here. We have three minutes left. Uh, maybe the group can, can also respond for those who uh, haven't looked at the Q&A box below. Uh, what happens if there's an interruption, an, an, an interruption to the connection during the replication? Uh, uh, yeah, Arvind uh, replied to the question, but uh, let me uh, mm -hmm. reiterate. So in case of uh, synchronous mirroring, if there is an interruption, uh, application would move forward with only one mirrors, but uh, whenever uh, whenever the connection restores, uh, it quickly uh, resynchronizes uh, the, the, the mirror based on the change block. So uh, it maintains the differences and it only syncs those blocks. And the same goes for a replication. Replication is also based on uh, changed blocks. So if there is an uh, interruption, uh, it will, whenever the replication uh, cycle restarts, it will, uh, re -synchronizes, it will synchronize those blocks. Okay, cool. Well, looks like we have another question that just came in. Uh, anonymous, how many nodes are possible in a, cl in a cluster? Is there a storage limit? I think those are two separate kind of concerns there. Um, do you want to try to tackle that one? Uh, I'll let uh, Gopal uh, answer this one. I mean, sure. Um, so, how many nodes are possible in a cluster is basically a Kubernetes cluster. So, um, you know, Kubernetes basically with the, uh, uh, with every release. Uh, um, says and tested around 5,000 nodes. However, um, for us, uh, uh, what we have tested so far is 96 nodes uh, within a cluster. So hopefully that answers that question. The second question was about, uh, uh, about the storage. So um, uh, Diamante being an HCI platform, as Narain pointed out, um, uh, there are different configs of nodes. They can uh, go from, you know, four terabytes um, per node uh, to 32 terabytes per node. And so if you do the math and multiply um, that out with the number of nodes, you will get an idea of uh, uh, the scale. We're talking petabyte scale uh, easily possible. I hope that answers the question. Back to you guys. I think it did. It did yeah, it, it did for me. Uh, I have uh, actually one one final question. A lot of this functionality is there in that storage, uh, uh, that Diamante storage stack and the diagrams and the layers. Is there any open source technology in there? I know things like Heptio Arc, uh, now Tanzu Valero are examples of open source uh, tooling that provide at least for some of the functionality that you described. Is there anything that you guys are consuming at, at that layer uh, that, that comes from uh, projects and out, out of the ecosystem? That's a, a great question. Um, you know, um, imagine uh, when we say cloud native storage, really what we mean is that it should be consumed like a service, right? So, you know, uh, take the case of uh, public cloud providers, um, you know, EBS uh, uh, can be consumed via Kubernetes cluster via the CSI interfaces, which are again all open source, right? But the the way EBS itself and the storage services, which basically Abhay alluded to, uh, they are all basically, um, you know, our own implementation. Now, uh, you ask a question, uh, what standard do we follow? So the, the standard which we follow is, is NVMe. So in, in, um, in, in this implementation, we are virtualizing NVMe uh, to each pod, so to speak. The NVMe is an open uh, standard and uh, it already has uh, drivers uh, available natively in, um, in Linux and Windows kernels, right? 
So from that perspective, yes, we leverage uh, open standards like CSI, um, NVMe, and moving forward, NVMe over fabrics. And uh, what Shilpa uh, showed the examples of how uh, replication objects um, are created and tied together is all within uh, the SIG storage group. Uh, SIG storage group, as you may know, within Kubernetes is one of the most active groups. And uh, they are, us together in the community, are trying to standardize uh, on these storage features as to how they are consumed. So the CRDs um, and the objects basically are all based on what the SIG storage group is is uh, is advocating. Okay. Did I cool. answer that question? You 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 did. Thank you, and I I, I appreciate uh, the the answer and Christy's patience uh, as we've ran a couple of minutes over. But I want to thank all of you for a great presentation today. Uh, that is all the questions we have. Uh, uh, for us today and the webinar recording and slides will be available later on today uh, and we look forward to seeing you at a future uh, CNCF webinar. Uh, have a great day y'all. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you so much. Have a great day.